Hello, and welcome to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast. Every week, Talking Heads will bring you in-depth insight and analysis through the lens of sustainability on the topics that matter to investors. In this episode, we'll be discussing disruptive technology. I'm Daniel Morris, Chief Market Strategist, and I'm delighted to be joined by Pam Hegarty, Portfolio Manager of our Disruptive Technology Strategy. Welcome, Pam, and thanks for joining me. Hi, Daniel. So glad to be here, and and thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. So we'll talk about disruptive technology broadly, and I guess if we think about the times that we live in, we've had, I guess, more than our fair share of disruption over the last two years, five years, 15 years. That, I guess, from your point of view as portfolio manager, is what creates the opportunities. So uh, I imagine for you, it's it's a chance to look for uh, stocks, for stories uh, at potentially more attractive valuations. But at the same time, of course, we have to think about uh, the interest rate outlook and the growth outlook. So if we go into that then, Pam, uh, what do you see right now in particular, the risks impacting the technology thematic and disruptive technology? Yes, I mean, that is really um, kind of a great way to kind of paint the picture of how we're trying to manage through a very difficult environment. And as you mentioned, there's just several uh, key risk factors. Uh, and we're just trying to keep a very balanced approach uh, with respect to the valuations within our portfolio, as well as the growth focus with also some very stable growth names. And I think the key risks are clearly geopolitical in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has added additional risk to potentially recession in Europe or perhaps even globally, and as well as to inflation. And uh, of course, along with that, the rising interest rates as not just the US Fed, but central banks around the world are looking to control inflation. And these rising interest rates clearly have an impact, an outsized impact on longer duration stocks. And many of our high growth tech stocks would fall into that category where they have very strong uh, free cash flow, but a lot of the discounted cash flow valuation is in is more in the out years. So they're very sensitive to these rates. You know, we're also still seeing COVID-19 with different uh, new variants and and shutdowns, unfortunately, in parts of China and so forth that can affect the supply chain as well as demand for certain tech products. Uh, We still have an an era of, uh, unfortunately, tariffs and other trade barriers as well as some supply chain nationalism. Uh, We're still seeing uh, the semiconductor shortages and supply disruptions, high freight rates, And there's still that background of regulation with respect to antitrust and data privacy. Um, And so, again, we're trying to take a very balanced approach and measure our upside relative to these various risk factors on a stock by stock basis. And that said, I I will say that uh, with the amount of correction we've had in valuations and in stock prices, uh, we see a lot of opportunities uh, going forward. Well, I have to say that it's a quite long list of, of risk factors, but if there's any comfort perhaps we can can take as those risks are, are being faced, I think, for pretty much all investors and, and not just you, and certainly it's not necessarily particular to technology, uh, but we do need to face those risks and, as you point out, look for those opportunities. So where exactly are you seeing opportunities and what are you focused on? Well, I would say the key thing is we remain very positive about the long-term secular growth drivers that are driving um, digital transformation throughout the economy. And so most recently in in the fall and spring, um, Gartner has actually raised their cloud computing forecast. And the estimate for the total public cloud services market uh, for 2022 is now something like 37% higher than it was in their November of 2020 outlook. And so that just gives you a sense for the extent to which cloud computing is being adopted and changing the way companies do business. And you've had a couple of the uh, key leaders in these cloud services companies point to the fact that this type of software actually helps companies uh, to lower their costs. So it's 
it can be a, a way to combat some elements of inflation as you make your processes more efficient, as you do things in the cloud, um, you know, it, it can have almost a deflationary effect. The other thing we're seeing is artificial intelligence becoming much more prevalent and uh, really turning into what I think is a foundational technology So for so many new innovations. And it's related to a lot of automation where we're seeing advances in robotics, um, in you know cars with advanced safety features, uh, and even uh, through uh, automated uh, software um, functionality. And there's also a really important trend to do more computing um, at the edge, which is part of this Internet of Things trend. So as you think about an autonomous vehicle, for example, you need to do a lot of that computing in the car itself uh, so that the car can safely navigate the roads and so forth. And you still need the cloud, you still need that centralized data and computing resource, but you also need more and more computing resources at the edge. And you know, one thing I want to point out is we, we also see e-commerce uh, slowing, but still trending up. So when you chart the adoption of e-commerce within total retail sales, there was quite a blip upwards because of the pandemic situation. And that's been normalizing, but it's still on an upward trend. So again, you know, IT spending, although slower than last year, is still expected to grow at a 4% pace. We have many companies, for example, in the cybersecurity space, pointing out increasing demand for their software. So certain areas of IT spending dominate over others. We also believe there's a lot of innovation in financial technology, in cybersecurity, and even in the way that software itself is developed that are very, very interesting. Um, and uh, the last point I would like to make is, you know, I truly believe that we are in a uh, semiconductor super cycle, and there's a lot of positive trends there as well. So we feel like we are still able to maintain our process, maintain our philosophy to invest in those companies that are leading and benefiting from these changes. Um, and by by really sharpening our pencils around valuation, uh, we see a lot of opportunity at, at this stage. If we think about uh, a little more of the opportunities you're looking at, uh, I guess, as we know, it takes differences of views to make a market. Uh, and I think if you have strong views out of consensus views, uh, those may turn out to be some of the most interesting opportunities. Where do you have uh, in your mind strong views that go against the current consensus thinking? I think one of the areas where I feel uh, most contrarian uh, to the consensus is with respect to the semiconductor cycle that I mentioned briefly. And so, you know, we definitely have a situation today where demand is much higher than supply. Uh, but as you mentioned, um, the risks of recession, you know, do go up as the Fed tightens and, and so forth in order to combat inflation. And so there is a lot of concern with respect to slowing, you know, potentially slowing demand in certain end markets for semiconductors, such as personal computers and perhaps even smartphones. But I actually believe that we are in a semiconductor super cycle and that the secular drivers of demand uh, will far outstrip uh, the short-term cyclical concerns. And so if you look at the current situation a little more closely, uh, as I mentioned, demand is much greater than supply. Um, there's potential room for a modest recession, yet we would still be in a shortage situation with respect to semiconductors. There's one great example. The CEO of a semiconductor capital equipment company recently uh, gave us a true story on their earnings call. He met with the executive from a large industrial conglomerate that is buying washing machines in order to rip out the semiconductors for use in their own industrial equipment. So think about that, willing to buy an entire washing machine just to access the semiconductor content in that equipment because they're selling a higher value piece of industrial equipment and it's that short. Another publicly traded foundry mentioned that demand was 25% higher than their capacity at the start of 2022 and that they're sold out through 2023. Another one of these semiconductor foundries, uh, these are companies 
that design houses outsource their manufacturing to sees a structural increase in the long-run semiconductor demand led by 5G and high-performance computing applications. They also expect capacity to remain tight through at least 2022, and they're working hard to ramp their capacity in 23 and beyond. So taking a step back from the current situation, a little bit of history, you know, the industry structure has actually evolved in a very positive way. So there's fewer uh, device manufacturers, there's fewer actual chip manufacturers, uh, and much more use of these uh, foundries. Uh, so outsourcing the manufacturing to fewer companies. And what that does is it's made the uh, addition of capacity more rational over time. So we have fewer supply-driven oversupply situations as a whole with respect to the industry. Um, even in the memory chip um, space, uh, the number of suppliers has consolidated uh, from both a DRAM perspective as well as a NAND perspective. And we have Moore's Law slowing down, so future advancements are based more on material science and the architecture of the device rather than trying to shrink the features. And this is intersecting with the demand situation where semiconductors are really the foundational technology that enables all of our secular growth themes. So whether it's cloud, AI, automation, or the internet of things and edge computing, semiconductors are the key component. And we're seeing uh, both increasing uh, content per unit. So for automobiles, for example, in 2013, the typical car, the average car, had just over $300 of semiconductor content. In 2022, it will have, the average car will have over $700 of semiconductor content. Even low-end cars today have well over $300 of content. So it's just that type of change. The other really fascinating trend that uh, we've recently learned more about is the push to bigger chips. So particularly for high performance computing, at around 2005, the ability to improve the clock speed of semiconductors started to hit a ceiling. So the large makers of the central processing units, you know, the key components for computers, whether they're servers or PCs, they started to make the chips bigger. So you use more what they call cores per chip. And basically what's happening is this trend is continuing. And even if unit growth is in the low single digit for PCs and servers, the actual area of the wafers that are needed to build these chips is growing at a high teens percentage going forward. So that creates a lot of demand for semiconductor capital equipment and for the materials that go into manufacturing those semis. So we really believe that these long-term trends are very important. And the way that we play this is in multiple paths. So we own a company that provides specialty materials to the semiconductor segment. Uh, we own some of the equipment suppliers. We own companies that uh, design the key chips that are used for these trends. And we also have exposure to the foundry part of the industry. So we we really believe that's non-consensus. Most of the street is hyper-concerned about short-term inventory corrections. And to that point, uh, we, we do uh, acknowledge that as a risk factor, but we believe that any such inventory correction in the short term is most likely to be isolated to very specific end markets. And because the end market demand for semiconductors has diversified so much, we've gone from the age of uh, mainframes to the age of PCs and then to smartphones dominating semiconductor demand. And today it's really these high performance computing applications like AI, uh, cloud data centers, autonomous vehicles and so forth that are driving the demand along with the need to do a lot more, have a lot more electronic devices at the edge. So sensors and more equipment, industrial equipment and consumer equipment tied to the internet. So we think that this diversification of end markets makes the industry less volatile over time. And in fact, the data shows that the standard deviation of the year-over-year -year unit growth in semiconductors has declined from 12% uh, in the decade of 1992 to 2000 uh, to currently closer to 8%. So the industry itself, the unit growth of the industry st is still volatile, but it's less volatile than it has been historically. 
and that would argue also for higher valuations for these companies. So um, it's, I think it's a very non-consensus view, but we're sticking to our positive outlook for the semiconductor industry. If I can perhaps summarize some of the things you've shared with us, Pam, uh, we started off with a list of the risks that we, we all face, uh, be it geopolitics, recession, rising rates, and so on. Uh, but if we step back and think about the, the world we live in today and the fundamental challenges we face, one of the key ones is simply a lack of labor. And the way businesses are going to respond to that is to invest in capital and ultimately to improve productivity. And that's really going to be dependent on technology. So we can certainly anticipate greater investment in technology. And you talked about these long-term secular growth drivers – digital transformation, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things. Uh, and despite these challenges, none of us think that any of that uh, is going to go away. And your last um, point was your out-of-consensus view uh, and a positive view on semiconductors and your belief that we are in a super cycle that is going to predominate over any of the short-term cyclical challenges the industry may face. Well, Pam, thank you very much for joining me. That's it for this week's episode of Talking Heads. If you would like more information, please reach out to your BNP Paribas Asset Management contact or check out our Investors Corner blog. We recommend subscribing to Talking Heads on your favorite podcast channel. You'll receive your podcast episodes every Monday afternoon. If you like the podcast, leave us a positive review and a nice rating. You've been listening to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast with me, Daniel Morris, and Pam Hegarty. Please do join us next week. And until then, take care. This podcast presentation includes a discussion on current market events and is not intended as investment advice or an offer of products or services by BNP Paribas Asset Management. Please keep in mind that the information and analysis in this presentation is only current as of the publication date.